I view the word conservative as a derivative of, of, of the word conserve. Uh, we want to conserve our money. We want to conserve our wealth. We want to conserve. We want to be smart. We want to be smart where we go, where we spend, how we spend. We want to conserve our country. Donald Trump there during the 2016 campaign and what it means to him to be a conservative. With us now, we have columnist and deputy editorial page editor at The Washington Post, Ruth Marcus, and professor at the U.S. Naval War College and author of the book, The Death of Expertise, Tom Nichols joins us. And Tom, let's start by reading from your new piece in The Atlantic on why you are leaving the Republican Party in the wake of Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation. You write, in part, quote, unlike Senator Susan Collins, who took pages upon pages of text on national television to tell us something we already knew, I will cut right to the chase. I'm out of the Republican Party. They have become all about winning. Winning means not losing. And so instead of acting like a co-equal branch of government responsible for advice and consent, congressional Republicans now act like a parliamentary party facing the constant threat of a vote of no confidence. So I'm out. The Trumpers and the Hucksters and the consultants and the hangers-on, like a colony of bees who exist only to sting and die, have swarmed together in a dangerous but suicidal cloud. And when that mindless hive finally extinguishes itself in a blaze of venom, there will be nothing left. Tom, thank All you so right much then. for being with us. I, uh, I wanted you to be on after I noticed that I had retweeted you about 14 times in one, <laughs> in one afternoon. And soon after I did, I then, of course, the punchline came, and that was that you were leaving oh, the Republican wow. Party. But. I thought one of your uh, most interesting and important points uh, is that the Republican Party became uh, what they hated, and that is uh, that is a group of people that wanted to achieve by judicial fiat that which they couldn't achieve at the voting booth. Yeah, I, it's really remarkable the way that the Republicans and the Democrats have kind of switched roles here, uh, and that the um, Republicans now act like they're uh, an embattled cultural minority uh, that is constantly on the verge of extinction, and that therefore uh, they have so little faith in their own ideas and so little faith in their ability to achieve what they want through legislation that the, their entire rationale for being has been to just the, engage in the raw exercise of power to put judges in places, unelected judges. Remember, Republicans used to complain all the time about unelected judges to carry forward their uh, agenda even long after, after they're gone. And, of course, uh, the judicial fiat that they want uh, achieved would be, of course, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, something that over 60 percent of Americans oppose. And yet that's, at the end of the day, at least on Twitter with a lot of conservative activists, that's what this fight has been primarily about, getting the fifth judge on the court to do something that six in ten Americans oppose. I think, and, and I should add that I, I don't represent any views but my own here, certainly not the Naval War College or anybody else. Um, I think that the rationalization about judges and Roe v. Wade is a way that Republicans have uh, rationalized lives of immense political hypocrisy. That as long as they're focused on getting that judge, that, that they will at least claim will overturn Roe v. Wade. They are uh, claiming that they are engaged in a project so important that it excuses all other sins, whether it's Donald Trump's character or high um, tariffs or caving to Russia or whatever it is that if pushed against the wall they say yes all those things are true but I'm doing it uh, to because of uh, the future of unborn children and that excuses mm -hmm. everything and I, I think that that um, I'm not sure I believe that in the sincerity of a lot of the folks who say that. I think a lot of people really do believe that, but I also think it's because uh, at this point that's all they're left with is to say I'm going to get a judge that's going to do these things and that that's why I'm accepting all this other terrible stuff. But you find yourself now in the position of, I was going to say a lot of conservatives, it appears to be fewer and fewer conservatives. Let me read another part of your piece. As an aside, let me say that I have no love for the Democratic Party, which is torn between totalitarian instincts on one side and po complete political malpractice on the other. Um, talk about picking your poison right now. 
uh, for so many actually real conservatives who believe in limited government. Um, there just is no good choice out there if the only choice is between the duopoly that has ruled American politics since Abraham Lincoln was elected president. I, I think this is the time for the centrists uh, to, to uh, join forces as best they can uh, because I think party discipline, uh, I've said many times the Republicans are acting like a parliamentary party all the way down to state legislatures and town halls and I, I just think that's unhealthy. We're losing the whole notion of separated powers and, and federalism and I think that it has to stop. Mika. Uh, Tom, you, you work at the Naval War College in Rhode Island, once represented by a classic Eastern Republican, John Chafee, a Marine Corps veteran, staunch Republican all of his life. Uh, you've made this declaration you're no longer you know, a member of that party. How many people have come up to you and said, what took you so long? That's really such a, um, that's one of the things that I instantly mute on Twitter when someone says, what took you so long? Um, I've been a Republican since 1979. Um, you know, it's, uh, to, to leave a party you've been a member of for 40 years is not something you take lightly. And I think I finally left uh, for good. I was kind of estranged from the party after the 2012 elections. Um, but I think to leave for good really required me to say there is no future in this party. There's nothing for me that when all this is over, I can identify the people that I'm going to kind of gravitate to to reconstitute the party. So it's not that it took a long time. No party is perfect. Um, there have been things about the Republican Party I've never liked, things I've always liked. Um, but I think this is where I finally came to believe that uh, the Republican Party just cannot recover from the compromises that it's made. I mean, at some point, you sell your soul, you don't get it back. Mm. Well, and Mika, that's actually, uh, Tom's point is a great one. I, as you know, I'm optimistic. I, I, I believe uh, that things can always get better, that... Uh, this country and, par and political parties can turn the corner, but really, who is there in the Republican Party that hasn't already sold their soul to Donald Trump? Right. Uh, and just because Donald Trump is going to leave power sooner or later, um, who do you associate yourself with? Mike Pence? Is Mike Pence a pres <laughs> is, is he presidential timber after he sold his soul to Donald Trump? Uh, who, what senator? Lindsey Graham? I, we could go down the list. No, we... And unfortunately, nobody has stood up uh, to the absolute worst instincts uh, and the breaching of constitutional norms of Donald Trump. And we asked time and time again why many of these Republicans who are so complicit don't see how this is going to end. Uh, it, it can't end well. I can't think of a positive ending. Ruth Marcus, um, does this open the door for an independent candidate? Where is this going? Because it doesn't feel like when you look at polling and you look at even the midterms and the Senate, it doesn't feel like the Democrats have, you know, an incredibly strong, sturdy uh, response to all of this in the form of uh, a leader. The the road for an independent candidate is a really uphill road. Look at um, mm -hmm. Michael Bloomberg, who has probably spent more time and money examining that road than anybody else. And he seems to have concluded that if he's going to run for president, it's going to be as a Democrat. There is a super crowded Democratic field. And how that shakes itself out is really um, up in the air, but I do, I share both Joe's optimism and his worry. Um, I have thought that our constitutional system is really resilient, but the shakiest leg of the stool has been the feckless um, legislative branch and the absolute unwillingness of senators and House members to stand up to President Trump, and we've seen that on display. And now I'm adding for my own, just to kind of cheer everybody up a little bit further, uh, a, a new worry, um, not about how the court is going to function internally, but um, because the justices will manage to forget what they saw um, and what they, uh, in Justice Kavanaugh's testimony, um, and mm -hmm. cooperate with him collegially. But in terms of the country's perception of the court as a legitimate nonpartisan institution. Justice Kavanaugh talked about that himself, but I really fear that he's done grave damage to that. 
Tom, it's always hard Nick. to leave your tribe. Um, and I have a question for you, which is the people that I have seen leave the tribe um, in the Trump era are people like you and Joe and Bill Crystal and Max Boot. It's intellectuals, writers, uh, uh, people in the media. Um, the president is extraordinarily popular among the rank and file, um, perhaps more so than any other president in years and years and years. And those include voters who have voted for people like Mitt Romney uh, and John McCain. Has the party changed or has Trump kind of pulled something out of the party that was there and latent or there um, and a minority part of the party and made it the main purpose of the party? I think there was always something in the party that resented uh, co coastal elites, intellectuals, um, but that we had a larger tent, we had a kind of an uneasy alliance among ourselves because I think we shared some basic values. Mm -hmm. I think Trump has turned the Republican project that particularly as it, w as it was conceptualized under Ronald Reagan as positive, mm -hmm. here are the things we're going to achieve into uh, we no longer have things to achieve. Here are the people I'm going to punish. Here are the people I'm going to get even with. And I think it's, you know, we, we Republicans don't like to talk about this, I think, but some of that radicalization happened after eight years of having Barack Obama. And some of this is mm -hmm. just, I think, racial resentment. Mm -hmm. um, it's the sense that the information age has produced a gap between people with education and people, not just with formal education, but who can manage in this 21st century economy and people who can't. Uh, and so I think that it's a combination of things. There was always a latent uh, racial tension, there was always a racial, uh, a latent um, class tension um, and, and a difficulty of dealing with, again, the, you know, the elites, the intellectuals and so on. Trump really took that and ran and said, uh, everybody in, is against you. He really, th and this is one of the reasons I left. The one thing that I think made Republicans and conservatives different from liberals in the 70s and the 80s, we were the party of optimism. We didn't think of ourselves as victims. Now we are the party of eternal victimhood. Trump supporters are constantly complaining about how they're looked down upon and they're forgotten and nobody loves them enough. Uh, and I th find that just amazing yeah. for people who control all the branches of government. <laughs> Well, another uh, sign of the times here. President Trump is apparently using opposition to separating migrant children from their parents at the southern border to attack the Democrats at a campaign rally on Saturday night in Kansas. The president repeated several of his usual falsehoods and exaggerations, along with adding this. Every single Democrat in the U.S. Senate has signed up for the open borders and it's a bill. It's called the Open Borders Bill. What's going on? And it's written by, guess who? Diane Feinstein. <laughs> There's My no God. bill by that name, Mika. It just doesn't exist. There's no bill by that name. And He's the just went making wild. that up. And if you're in the audience, you have to be asking yourself, why does Donald Trump think I am so stupid? Why does Donald Trump play me for a fool? Why does Donald Trump well, think that I'm such an idiot that I can't? I feel I, I know that so many of those people, Mika, in that Kansas audience have to be angry at Donald Trump for, making, for him thinking they are so stupid, that they are such bumpkins, that they are such fools, that they can't just, Ruth, that they can't just go on Google. I know this morning they have to be deeply deeply disappointed that the president would just lie use through his teeth to him way. and use them as a punchline. No, they didn't sound all that disappointed. And, you know, every time you think we've uh, reached a new low, um, President Trump goes a little further. But this was just an extraordinary amount of blatant dishonesty in the service of nativist ugliness. And so the combination of those two threads is such a um, illustration of where the Republican Party has gone. I've not a member of either party, haven't been for a long time. Um, but you have to, I, I hear the anguish in the voices of all of my Republican and former Republican friends who remain conservatives and believe that 
conserving is um, you know limited government and changing slowly and then to why and and openness to a sunny Reagan-esque vision of America um, and then to right. hear the president pull stunts like this is just sickening. Well, I mean, and, and Mika, the, the the lying, and and you even see it, uh, you see it all over the place from people that I've known and who've known me for a long time and known that basically I'm boring. I've written three books. They all say the same thing. They're all attacks on big government republicanism. Uh, 2004, 2009, 2013. When it when it comes to bloated uh, bloated budgets, and I mean, I'm a one trick pony. And there are a few people out there like that still, but they seem to be fading by the day. Tom Nichols, thank you so much for being on the show this thank morning. Thank you, Tom. It's great having you on. Thanks for having Up me. Up next, 17 years after the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, a new poll shows Americans, including veterans, want out. We'll discuss that next on Morning Joe. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.